Hello, welcome back to Dinosaurs. We're going to keep going with Module 3, finishing up the Ceriskia. So we're almost through, just uh, going to finish up this week. And then next week, we'll get into the last of the remaining theropods the, and getting into birds. And then we'll talk about the sauropodomorphs and the sauropods. And then we'll be done with Module 3. We'll move into Module 4, the Ornithischia. And then we'll... Uh, keep on moving. So before we do that, though, some announcements. So if you have any questions, as always, please feel free to reach out to me. All right, so let's review where we were last time. Uh, so last time we talked about the Carnosaurs, uh, in particular the Allosaurids. Um, they're the most successful on which continents? So again, uh, not all dinosaurs are present at all times, and not all dinosaurs are present in all places. This uh, The Mesozoic is a very long time period, and it starts with one uh, supercontinent, Pangaea, but over time it drifts and rifts apart, and uh, you'll see the impact that it has on on the on the biodiversity, on the different animals that are present in each of these distinct ecosystems as the continents drift farther and farther apart from each other into kind of a more modern configuration. So, which continents were the carnosaurs on? So, were they present in? Laurasia, the northern continents, North America, uh, and kind of Asia. There might be a little land bridge up here in the north. Or were they present in the Gondwanan continents, the southern continents, South, South America, Africa, Antarctica, Australia, and then India and Madagascar are kind of sandwiched in here. Or were they present in Europe in kind of this like isolated sort of archipelago of little islands in here during the Jurassic period? Uh, or were they kind of all over the globe? So were carnosaurs just everywhere? And hopefully the answer is... Uh, so mostly the northern continents. So the carnosaurs were very dominant in the North American continent, very dominant in Asia, uh, some scattered things in uh, Europe, but mostly North American Asia. Uh, very so initially they're present in the southern continents, but they, they don't really get a foothold. It's uh, primarily the uh, ceratosauria, the, particularly the abelosaurs, that really dominate the southern continents. And uh, we'll see a fairly similar pattern with some of the dinosaurs that we're going to talk about today. Uh, so let's review again. Uh, so carnosaurs were most successful in which time period? So when were they most active? So what do you think? So look at the dinosaurs on that diagram there. Uh, try to pick out a carnosaur, that'll help. Hmm, which of these is a carnosaur? What are the features of a carnosaur? Okay, well, looking at these dinosaurs, the carnosaur that's on here is Allosaurus. So Allosaurus is kind of the most commonly found uh, carnosaur. And what you see is that uh, it corresponds to, oh, let me get my laser pointer here, corresponds to the Jurassic. Uh, remember early on in the Triassic, so the answer is Jurassic, early on in the Triassic, dinosaurs were relatively small. Uh, the Herasaurs were kind of the largest carnivores. And then we get into like the Dilophosaurids at the, at the very end. But Dinosaurs are relatively small because they're competing with the Phytosaurs, they're competing with the Rawasukians, uh, the herbivorous dinosaurs are competing with the Adosaurs. So there's a lot of competition during the Triassic, but then there's the end Triassic extinction, and those all go extinct, and dinosaurs are free to expand their roles, which expands their body sizes and expands their diversity, and they really start kind of branching out into all these different niches. Uh, as we get into the early Cretaceous, and into the late Cretaceous, there's a shift kind of away from the large sauropod dinosaurs and the herbivory dinosaurs are really kind of more dominated by these ornith the ornithopod dinosaurs, particularly later the hadrosaur duck-billed dinosaurs, which we haven't talked about yet. Uh, we've mentioned Iguanodon in passing a couple times, but uh, really the sauropods start kind of uh, fading away uh, as we get further and further into the Mesozoic. Uh, probably related to a climate change. And these carnosaurs that were adapted to hunt those big sauropods, uh, they fade with them and something else takes up the mantle. And so if we look up here in the Cretaceous, looking for a big old 
uh, carnivorous dinosaur. Ah, here we go. There, there, there's, there's Tyrannosaurus. What is Tyrannosaurus? Tyrannosaurus is a coelosaur. So we're going to talk about coelosauria today, coelurosauria today. Uh, we've talked already about all these other different theropods, kind of as we've been going up, getting more and more advanced over time. You see all these changes marked at the branches along this cladogram here. We talked last time about the Carnosauria, the Allosauridae, and the Carcharodontosauridae, the shark tooth lizards. Uh, today we're going to talk about the Solarosauria, uh, which means the uh, hollow lizards, hollow boned lizards. Um, so we're going to start over here with uh, the Tyrannosauroidea. So it's topped off by Tyrannosauridae. Those are the most closely related to Tyrannosaurus rex in particular. Uh, but we're going to start here with some of the more basal members and kind of work our way up to the more derived, more advanced members. So uh, Tyrannosauroidea as a group, uh, Tyrannosaur translates to tyrant lizards. So uh, here's just look at the all the different body plans here. Uh, a lot of very superficial resemblances, uh, but a lot of different sizes, a lot of different shapes. Some are a little bit more slender than others. Some are a little bit bulkier, the uh, Tyrannosaurus rex being kind of the most bulky of them all. Um, but they're the, a very long lasting group of dinosaurs and they're very ecologically important because they form, uh, if not the top predator in their group, in their ecosystem, uh, a very uh, important predator in the ecosystem. So they're a very important and very e ecologically impactful group of the Silurosaurs. Uh, some traits of the Tyrannosauroidea is they have uh, the fused uh, skull and jaw bones for a stronger bite. So in some of the earlier, uh, more basal theropod dinosaurs like Coelophysids and Dilophosaurids and Ceratosaurids, uh, there was the kind of floating premaxilla and the, the, skull, the skull was, it was called a kinetic skull, so that when they bit the skull could flex and absorb some shock. So uh, they were, their skulls were a little bit more flexible, which is good for absorbing impact, but it's bad for really massive, strong bite forces. And so in Tyrannosauroids, these are fused, which uh, it, bite the, it, it doesn't absorb as much impact. So that's a problem, but uh, Tyrannosauroids in general are just larger. And uh, the fused upper bones here uh, really allows them to get to that, those really strong high bite forces that we talked about uh, in one of the homeworks a while ago. Uh, another feature is that they have sort of uh, U-shaped uh, premaxillary front teeth. So uh, famous for like the dagger knife-like serrated uh, maxillary teeth, but the ones out front here, the front teeth, uh, kind of like U-shaped in, in cross-section. Uh, another thing that we see, uh, particularly later, is that uh, they minimize uh, digit number three, uh, the middle finger. So what we've seen along in theropods before is that the pinky is missing in most of them, I think all of them. Uh, the in the uh, ring finger is missing in quite a lot of them. Uh, this we start minimizing the middle finger, and in, ca in the case of T-Rex, left with only kind of the quote-unquote thumb and, and uh, pointer finger, index finger. Um, so that's a, a common characteristic of Tyrannosaurus. In addition, uh, you'll see also a reduced forelimb, so the reduced front limbs, uh, some more reduced than others, uh, none quite as reduced as Carnotaurus, the Carnosaurid that we talked about last time, where with the little tiny itty bitty arms, but as you know, T-Rex is uh, pretty famous for its fairly small arms, but still very well muscled, uh, still probably useful for at least some things, uh, not as reduced as we saw in some of the really advanced, really derived Carnosaurs. So that's Tyrannosauroidea. Again, just look at all these. We're not gonna talk about all of these. Uh, I wish we had time to, but we don't. So uh, let's pick and choose a couple uh, good examples. So uh, we're going to start with Proceratosaurus. So uh, that's weird. So we talked about the Ceratosaurs last time, uh, the horned, or actually I guess two classes ago, the horned lizards 
uh, pro ceratosaurus means early horned lizard, because uh, originally it was thought to be a basal ceratosaur. Uh, why? Because remember, ceratosaurs are known for that nose crest, uh, and it has one. So kind of similar to uh, Dilophosaurus with the two nose crests, this is one nose crest similar to the ceratosaurs. Uh, and it's, it turns out that upon further analysis, uh, it's actually a, a very basal tyrannosauroid from the Jurassic of England and the white limestone. And so again, when we think about Tyrannosaurus, uh, we think about, ah, that guy. So we think about massive carnivorous apex predators, uh, these giant super predators. And uh, you know, this thing's not a giant super predator. Uh, it is a carnivore and it's a very active hunter, but it's not an apex predator. So uh, these tyrannosauroids, they start, you know, relatively small and we move up from there. Um, but uh, initially it was lumped in with ceratosaurs. Uh, it was even at one point lumped in with allosaurs, uh, but upon further inspection, it was closer aligned with uh, Guan Long, which is an Asian tyrannosaurid, which, which we're not gonna talk about. Um, another thing you see with these is that uh, we discussed earlier when we were talking about endothermic uh, warm-blooded versus ectothermic cold-blooded, uh, really the larger dinosaurs were probably able to regulate their heat uh, just because of thermal inertia, just because they're so large. But the smaller dinosaurs needed some sort of insulation probably. And so smaller, very active dinosaurs probably had a high metabolism, probably pointed to them being more warm-blooded uh, if that's actually the case then they need to preserve that warmth somehow. So they probably used feathers. Uh, what you can see here in Proceratosaurus though, is that uh, there's no preserved evidence of feathers. And so in the reconstruction here, we see kind of a fully feathered version, uh, except with the bare feet here, uh, very similar to like an ostrich where the body is feathered and the legs are not. Uh, you see the scale differentiation on the feet here with kind of the more robust scales in the front. Again, very similar to like an ostrich, their front uh, the front of legs is kind of very armored with more robust scales so that when they hit into like branches or something like that, it doesn't damage the front if you've ever been walking through the woods and hit your shin on a log, you know the pain of that. Um, so they often had like more armor at the front and maybe a little bit less at the back. Uh, but this is the feathered version and this is the not feathered version. Uh, we don't really know which, but looking at the other tyrannosauroids that we have a little bit better fossil record of and kind of making the inferences from other things we see, uh, the feathered version is probably the correct version. Uh, the coloring is a little bit speculative. The banding is a little bit speculative. We do see banding in like Sornoceropteryx. So we talked about that a little bit earlier. Uh, the counter shading here that you see the dark on the top and the light on the belly, again, that's speculative but it's things that we see in modern animals. It's things that we see in other similar size, similar niche dinosaurs. Uh, they've also got the bandit mask on here. Again, uh, not preserved in this specimen, but looking at other animals that live in this sort of environment, the bandit mask is a very common coloration. So while we don't know anything about the feathers and the coloration pattern, uh, we can make educated guesses about it. <clears throat> Uh, in some cases, the guesses are more educated than others, <clears throat> but it's never just random. It's never just pulled entirely out of the air. <clears throat> Even the things that we don't know, uh, we can make pretty good guesses about. All right, so uh, next one is uh, Stokosaurus. So it's a Stokes lizard, which honors a Utah geologist named Stokes uh, from the Morrison Formation out west at western U.S. in the Jurassic of Utah again, a, a very basal tyrannosauroid. And again, you see the size here. So not all of these tyrannosauroids are, are massive like Tyrannosaurus. Uh, why not? Well, in this particular instance, in the Morrison formation, we've talked a lot about other carnivorous dinosaurs that are present in the Morrison formation. Uh, Allosaurus, again, makes up like 75-ish percent of all of the carnivorous dinosaur specimens from the Morrison, there's Allosauruses all over the place. Uh, and then there's the Ceratosaurus, a little bit like smaller, a little bit more delicate, a little bit more able to go into more of the like wooded type quarters. And Torvosaurus, again, a little bit more slender. 
um, able to fit in other places where the Alice, the more like rugged and beefier Allosaurids can't go. Um, but they're competing with these large carnivores in all the niches in the ecosystem. And so they're kind of reduced to this role of feeding on kind of the smaller animals of the ecosystem. Uh, they're all known only from hip fragments though. So uh, again, there's this question of like, uh, do they have feathers? Do they not? They're relatively small, but they are active hunting carnivores. So probably kind of towards the warm blooded end of the spectrum. And if they are, they need some sort of insulation. So often they're drawn with feathers. You see here, there was no attempt made to put any kind of patterning on the feathers. Uh, some artists are more comfortable making those leaps than others. And you know that's understandable, but it's very important that we try to reconstruct these animals because it, it really helps to kind of try to put flesh on the bones. And remember that every one of these reconstructions is a hypothesis. And eventually if data comes in later that disproves this reconstruction, then we have to reconstruct the reconstruction. And that, that's what you've seen over time. The dinosaur is changing in the interpretations through time from those early plodding, quadrupedal, slow, uh, lizard-like things to now this very modern, very active, very kind of almost bird-like form interpretation that we see now. So that's kind of what's changed here. Uh, another Tyrannosaur, Dilong, uh, translates to emperor dragon, uh, found from the early Cretaceous um, uh, formation, the Yizhang formation in, in China. Uh, again, it's one of these more basal Tyrannosauroids, not a gigantic. So when we think Tyrannosaur, we always think huge like this guy, not, not so for all of them. Uh, this one, however, does have some feather impressions found from around the jaw area and around the tail area. And so this is a small kind of basal-ish Tyrannosauroid. It had feathers, there's evidence of feathers in this specimen, were the other small basal Tyrannosauroids feathered? The answer is probably for the smaller ones. Since this is a very basal member of Tyrannosauroidea, as we move up to the more advanced forms like say Tyrannosaurus rex itself, uh, is Tyrannosaurus rex feathered because the earlier Tyrannosauroids were feathered? Uh, well, we'll see. Uh, we've already talked about it a little bit. I don't want to spoil it yet, but, um, and then also like, okay, well, this was feathered on the jaw and the tail. Was it entirely feathered? It's drawn as entirely feathered here. It's drawn as entirely feathered here. Uh, again, probably the smaller forms were entirely feathered. The larger forms, maybe not. So what, let's talk about that when we get there. But this thing's probably kind of scurrying around eating these smaller critters that eventually become the mammals that we know of today. So the first mammal, the first true mammals appear in the Jurassic period alongside the dinosaurs and they're very small rat-like, shrew-like critters. And these dinosaurs are actively hunting them. Uh, the tables turn at the end of the Cretaceous though when the meteor hits and we'll talk about that a little bit later on in the class. Uh, another is Eotyrannus. So it means dawn tyrant or early tyrant from the early Cretaceous Wessex formation uh, in the, on the Isle of Wight in the UK. Um, again, you look at the size, uh, we're getting a little bit bigger here, but I wouldn't call this a large dinosaur. Uh, why not? Because again, it's competing with other carnivorous dinosaurs that are in its environment. We talked before about the carnivorous dinosaurs that are present in Europe at this time, in particular in England at this time, the much larger carnosaur, uh, Neovenator, Neovenator. So this is a Neovenator carnosaur here. Uh, that's one of the apex predators of this ecosystem. And then as you get kind of near the water's edge, uh, Baryonyx, the heavy clawed Spinosaurid, was also a very dominant active predator. And so again, Eotyrannus is sort of forced in this particular environment uh, to scramble after some of the smaller prey that are available here. Um, there's very poor preservation, very scarce material of Eotyrannus. Uh, in general, the larger the dinosaur is, the more robust the bones are, the more likely they are to be preserved, uh, especially in these Tyrannosauroids because we're starting to see some of these developments that lead towards birds where the bones are getting uh, a little more fragile 
And so the smaller specimens with the more delicate bones uh, are less likely to be preserved. And so we, we have less material from them. Uh, as we'll talk about later with Tyrannosaurus rex, there are whole complete skeletons almost of Tyrannosaurus rex. So even though they're like way more famous and way more expensive, uh, they're also actually a little bit more common because they're a little bit more likely to survive all of the things that happen on the way from death to fossilization, to collection, to being mounted on display in a museum. Uh, another early Tyrannosauroid, or I guess this is a very late Tyrannosauroid, sorry, uh, Dryptosaurus. Uh, we've talked about them before. Uh, Dryptosaurus translates to uh, tearing lizard, and they're from the very late Cretaceous of Eastern North America uh, in, from New Jersey. So again, uh, dinosaurs, we, we always think about dinosaurs being out west. Uh, in North America, there's dinosaurs in New Jersey, dinosaurs in Connecticut, dinosaur footprints in New York. So uh, dinosaurs are on the east side of America, but remember that a lot of the Mesozoic sediment has been stripped away and eroded away on the east coast. We don't have quite as complete a record on the east coast of America. So uh, mostly when we're talking about North American dinosaurs, we're talking about the Laramidian western dinosaurs, but we're also, there are also some Appalachian uh, East Coast dinosaurs, and this is a good example of this. Uh, remember, it was previously called Laylaps, but there ended up being that mite that was already named that. Um, you see, looking at the forelimbs here, they're reduced, but they're not as reduced as in Tyrannosaurids, and they have the three-fingered claw with the pinky and the ring finger uh, gone, uh, lost. And uh, you see they still have three fairly prominent digits, uh, although the middle finger is starting to show uh, some reduction uh, and they're tipped with these massive claws. Uh, one thing you can see here, uh, this is the famous uh, Leaping Laylaps painting by Charles Knight from the late 1800s. One of the first paleo art reconstructions to really show dinosaurs in the modern active dynamic uh, bird-like uh, hunting and really just instead of the plodding slow lizard. Uh, one problem though, is if you look at the hands and start counting the digits, uh, one, two, three, four, five, oops. So we didn't have that material at the time. And so we, again, he was making a reconstruction based on what he knew and uh, often paleo art gets it wrong. Uh, so it is what it is, but this is still a very famous, very influential paleo art piece. Everybody makes mistakes. I'm sure I've made mistakes. I'm probably gonna make mistakes today. I think I've already made mistakes today, but again, we get new information. We are able to see that what we did before was actually wrong uh, and we update and we move on and we get better over time. And that's what you can do in this class too. If you don't like the results you're getting so far, uh, make some changes, make some updates, change what you're doing with new information and get better results. Uh, so that's Dryptosaurus. Uh, now we move into things that we really would think of when we think about Tyrannosauroids. Uh, so Eutyrannus translates to feather tyrant. Uh, it's a, um, I, think, I don't think that's right, Procer, I think I gotta change that. There's a mistake. <laughs> uh, it's feather tyrant, it's a, so it's a, one of these uh, Tyrannosauroids uh, from uh, the early Cretaceous in China. And uh, unlike T-Rex, it shows three fingers on the hand. And if you look at the arms, they're quite a bit more elongated than T-Rex's arms. And it still has three fingers uh, instead of T-Rex's two fingers. Uh, it's kind of more tr uh, transitional from the ceratosaurs, uh, this kind of form. I guess that might be right then, pro, pro ceratosaur, I think, okay. Um, and there also is a, a, like a crest along the snout, again, similar to ceratosaurs. So that's uh, probably where that proserata comes from. Um, one thing we also see with U. Tyrannus that's very important, and probably the most important thing about this is that uh, it's a very large Tyrannosaur. You see here's a human for scale. Uh, this is a very large thing, but you see the reconstruction here. Uh, it doesn't look like a typical Tyrannosaurus reconstruction because it's covered in feathers. So what evidence do we have for that? Well, this happens to have a lot of very well-preserved material with feather imprints on the foot, the pelvis, the arm, and the neck area. And so again, there's this argument about, okay, sure, we found evidence for feathers on some part of the body, 
does that mean the entire dinosaur is feathered? No, it doesn't. But when we find evidence of feathers on so many different scattered parts of the body, uh, it starts to become pretty clear that this thing was probably covered in feathers. Uh, but these are early proto feathers, so it's not really what we think about with birds, like flight feathers. These are more like uh, almost like fur, so they're very kind of plumaceous or filamentous feathers. Uh, again, for insulation uh, rather than for flight. And so why would they have this? Especially why would a very large tyrannosauroid have these feathers for insulation? Remember just the thermal inertia of being large in other dinosaurs is usually good enough. Uh, in this case, they lived in a very cold, very seasonal environment. And so it helped there to have the insulation. Uh, in the winter, you needed insulation. Uh, and in the summer, it probably provided a little protection too from the, the hot, hot sun in the summer. So. Uh, Euteranus is a very important specimen from China. So this is a very large Tyrannosaurid from Asia. Uh, let's go to North America. Albertosaurus is another uh, very large Tyrannosauroid. Uh, it translates to Alberta lizard because it's found in the late Cretaceous of Western Canada, Alberta, and also possibly in Mexico, although uh, Gorgosaurus is possibly uh, a, a synonym. So. Um, uh, when we see Albertosaurus, so uh, Euteranus had the three-fingered hand. Uh, Albertosaurus really now has just the two digits. Oops, sorry, these two digits. Um, very similar to uh, Tyrannosaurus rex. Uh, it also has the reduced forelimbs, uh, very much like Tyrannosaurus rex, and uh, though they're more derived uh, Tyrannosaurids. Uh, but it's not as large, uh, but it is large. So looking at the size comparisons here, Here's Tyrannosaurus rex, the largest of the Tyrannosauridae. Uh, here's Albertosaurus here, uh, pretty close. Um, another very large uh, specimen here is uh, uh, Tar Tarbosaurus, which is the next one. So Tarbosaurus is from uh, Mongolia and China. It translates to alarming lizard. So it's known from the late Cretaceous uh, Nemect formation. Uh, and so we see now uh, very large tyrannosauroids in North America, very large tyrannosauroids in Asia, the Tarbosaurus, uh, Euteranus to a lesser extent. Uh, we still haven't talked anything about the Gondwanan continents, the southern continents. We haven't seen any tyrannosauroids from South America. We haven't seen any from Africa. We haven't seen any from Madagascar or India or Australia or Antarctica. These tyrannosauroids are very much present in the northern continents, the Laurasian continents, mostly North America and Asia to a lesser extent, Europe, but they're mostly absent from the southern continents. What's going on there? Again, it's the abilosaurs that are mostly dominating the southern continents. And so again, not all dinosaurs are present in all places at all times. And the faunas that are present shift over time in response to the environment. Uh, and in some cases, the environment even shifts in time to respond to them. So there's a link possibly between like the dominant herbivore dinosaurs and the dominant plant types in the area, one driving the other, not sure which. We'll talk about that when we get to the sauropods. But uh, just remember how all these things are sort of connected and there's these patterns that we see over time. Uh, so uh, why is this an alarming lizard? Well, it's just, it's very large. So uh, quite a bit larger than you, Tyrannus. Uh, Batar translates to, I think, king, so uh, alarming lizard king. Uh, not quite as large as Tyrannosaurus rex, but, but very large. Uh, was it feathered like Eutyrannus? We saw an Asian Tyrannosauroid Eutyrannus that was probably fully feathered. Uh, is this slightly larger or quite a bit larger specimen fully feathered? Well, uh, the impressions that we have of its skin are scaly. And so Tarbosaurus was at least partially scaly. Uh, does that mean it didn't have any feathers? No, we don't have evidence of the integ integument, the covering over the entire body, but it's pointing in this direction of, again, larger Tyrannosauroids, uh, probably limited feathers and perhaps no feathers. Uh, and then uh, another thing that's famous about this is that uh, there was a big controversy over a 2012 
auction of a Tarbosaurus skeleton in New York City where the skeleton was actually illegally taken out of Mongolia and the Mongolian government has laws against the export of specimens. Uh, they're all supposed to be worked on in Mongolia and displayed in Mongolia, again, to kind of counteract that, that history of colonialism and exploitation where uh, scientists from other countries would come in, uh, hire people, hire locals to do the backbreaking labor of extracting the fossils, not really sharing the professional knowledge, the scientific knowledge of the specimens, uh, and then the specimens are exported back to the country where research is done and then they're hung in a museum in that other country. And so the natural resources are stripped from the country where the fossils were, the natural history is lost, and the opportunity to grow expertise in the local community is lost along with that. And so a lot of countries now are starting to make laws against that. And uh, they ran, a ground, ran afoul of those laws in this instance. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how it turned out, but uh, it was definitely a thing that was in the news. Uh, just a funny cartoon here. I'm not sure why it's auctioning off humans to humans, but whatever. Uh, now we get to the one that we've kind of been you know, building up to, the uh, Tyrannosauroidea, named for Tyrannosaurus uh, rex. So rex is the species name. Uh, it translates to tyrant lizard king, and obviously we all understand why. It's from the very latest Cretaceous of Western North America. So Tyrannosaurus rex were alive, they were still there uh, when Chicxulub made its impact. So they are among the last dinosaurs on earth. Uh, they are there to witness the impact, which not a lot of the other dinosaurs that we talked about make it. Uh, we're gonna have a whole lecture on that. At the end of the class, we'll talk about what the dinosaur faunas looked like uh, right at the very bitter end and what that transition was like going from the Cretaceous into the Cenozoic, the kind of modern world as we know it. Um, obviously, Tyrannosaurus rex is very famous for its massive size, its huge teeth, the kind of goofy little arms, and uh, <laughs> you know the, the two, two claws. Um, but another thing that we sort of talked about earlier in the class is that not only is it huge, not only is it massive, not only is it a very well-adapted carnivore, uh, it also has a large-ish brain for its size. And so this is something that we start seeing here in these uh, Solurosauria, these kind of, this group that eventually includes birds is that uh, these dinosaurs have a larger brain than a lot of the previous dinosaurs that we've talked about. And that's an evolutionary advantage in itself. In fact, uh, Homo sapiens, uh, for example, were smaller than uh, Homo neanderthalensis but we allegedly, and that's maybe not actually true anymore, uh, allegedly had a larger brain, uh, or at least a more complex brain, and that may be why we quote unquote won and why Neanderthals are not here anymore. Uh, although I did see something recently where Neanderthal may have actually had a larger brain case, but uh, allegedly our big evolutionary advantage, we don't have sharp teeth, we don't have sharp claws, uh, all we have is our big old noggins and our ability to interact with each other and communicate with each other and share knowledge with each other and utilize tools with our free hands. Uh, that's all we have other than that we're kind of soft, squishy, fleshy things uh, that don't stand a chance against something like this. Um, so when you start combining those killer tools of a massive carnivore along with increased intelligence, uh, you start getting this super predator and Tyrannosaurus rex is just probably the, the most uh, well-adapted well predator of, of really all time. Uh, there is nothing that really compares to it in the modern day from a sized standpoint, from a just, it's just, that's why it's called the Tyrant Lizard King, right? Uh, there's multiple, the, uh, there's multiple nearly complete skeletons of Tyrannosaurus Rex. So again, as these things get larger, the bones are more robust, more likely to survive intact. And so we have some very famous specimens that even get named. So uh, Sue is on display at the museum in Chicago. Uh, they've very recently, and uh, somebody made a nice discussion post about this, um, they've reconstructed what it would look like during life at full size scale. Uh, you see here they're in there painting the colors on. Again, uh, speculative with what the colors are. Uh, one thing that we don't see here is we do not see feathers 
anywhere. Uh, one trend that we've recently seen with Tyrannosaurus rex is, uh, okay, well, maybe large theropods weren't feathered fully, but probably they had something along the back or the head. So you'll often see a, with like a crest of feathers on the back or maybe like a strip along the back or the tail. <clears throat> uh, well, what do we know about Tyrannosaurus rex's uh, integument? It's, it's covering. Well, we've got evidence from kind of lots of different locations along the body. Again, skin impressions and feather impressions and like in mammals, hair, uh, those things are not usually preserved. And so only in exceptional specimens do we get glimpses of what this looks like. And we almost never see it over extensive large areas. And so we have to kind of piece together evidence from multiple specimens uh, the red areas you see here are areas, or at least like roughly areas, uh, where we have evidence of skin impressions on Tyrannosaurus rex. And what we see is that we see a lot of scales. We see a lot of different size scales. Uh, something that we kind of see with like modern reptiles is that they have varying scale patterns over different parts of their body that serve kind of different purposes. Again, like in the example of modern birds, you'll often see like these kind of more armored scales on the front of the legs and smaller ones on the back of the legs, just like in ostriches, for example. Um, we see from all over the body here, everywhere that we see it's scales of some kind. There's no evidence for feathers. Now, does that mean that feathers don't exist? Well, we don't have skin impressions from the back or from the tail or from the arms or from the very top of the head. And these are kind of the usual suspects for where we might expect feathers. So uh, there is no evidence for feathers on Tyrannosaurus rex at the moment. Uh, there's a lot of evidence for feathers on U. Tyrannus, a somewhat large tyrannosauroid, uh, lots of evidence from some of the more basal tyrannosauroids. So we don't know, but remember that absence of evidence the fact that we don't see feathers preserved is not evidence of absence. Just because we don't see it doesn't necessarily mean it wasn't there and it didn't happen. But we do have quite a lot of data of what this covering, the integument of T-Rex was like, and we don't see feathers, we see scales. And so at the moment, the safest reconstruction, the most likely reconstruction is that this is a very large theropod relying on thermal inertia to maintain its heat uh, feathers would actually maybe be a detriment because it would make it more difficult for it to get rid of heat and the massive body size, like with modern elephants, makes getting rid of heat actually harder than holding heat in. And so uh, that's the big debate here. And, uh, you know, as we get more evidence, uh, we may in fact find a feathered area of T-Rex's body, but we don't have that yet. Uh, so that's the Tyrannosauroidea. Uh, let's move into the Ornithomimosauria, and we're just going to talk about a couple of these, uh, and then that'll be the end of the lecture for today, and that'll be weekend. Woo! Uh, so uh, the first one we're going to talk about is uh, Pelicanomimus. It translates to, as it sounds, uh, pelican mime. So pelican, you know, the big broad beak with the big old um, throat pouch. Uh, it's from the early Cretaceous of Spain. It's a basal Ornithomimosaurid which translates to ornitho is bird and mimo is mimic, soar is lizard. So it's a bird mimic lizard. Uh, it's named for its elongate snout like a pelican and it's possible like throat pouch, again, like a pelican. Um, one thing that we see is that it has these very elongate uh, metatarsals. So when you look at like a bird, like a flamingo, or a heron or something like that, one of the walking birds, uh, it looks like their knees kind of bend backwards as they're walking. Uh, you're not actually looking at the knee, you're looking at their ankle. So the knee is actually up here and it's bending in the quote unquote right direction. Uh, this joint here that's bending in the quote unquote wrong direction is the actual, is the ankle. And then this is, this is what you kind of think is the ankle is actually the joint with the toes. So um, we see these elongate metatarsals, uh, these very elongate bones here below the 
the ankle, which it looks like a knee, but it's actually the ankle, uh, very long lever kind of action uh, built for speed. So these things are active runners. Uh, we see uh, somewhat elongated metatarsals in the earlier theropods, but this is sort of extreme. I mean, you see it here where you have these elongated metatarsals below this ankle joint here, uh, but not to the degree of in these ornithomimids, the, the bird mimics, and uh, that they're built, they're built for running and that's just what they'll do. Uh, it, one thing we also see is that if we look at the skull, uh, it retains some teeth as in some of the more primitive theropods. They're all kind of toothed carnivores or at least mostly toothed carnivores. Uh, when we get up to the ornithomimids, only the basal ones have teeth. Uh, what you'll notice though as well is that the teeth are very much not like Tyrannosauroid teeth. They're small kind of pointy kind of peggy teeth. Uh, they're probably omnivorous teeth, uh, maybe piscivorous teeth. So they might be eating fish, uh, maybe like insects and things. They're probably not taking on other dinosaurs. So we're starting to see a change in the body to adapt towards running and speed and light and agility. And we're also starting to see adaptations away from uh, meat eating, away from macro carnivoria, eating very large uh, meat sources. Uh, so that's Pelicanomammus. Uh, Dinocaris uh, translates to horrible hand. It's from the very late Cretaceous, uh, again from the Nemect formation of Mongolia. So this is another uh, Asian uh, Silerosaur. And uh, originally all they discovered was these, the shoulder and the upper arm, the ulna radius bone and the fingers and these massive claws. Uh, it was originally called Zofia's monster named after a Polish paleontologist, uh, Zofia. And uh, basically when we had only this material kind of the imagination just goes wild. Like, oh my God, look at these massive claws for just ripping and tearing flesh must be some horrible carnivorous, you know, horrible monster. Uh, and well, once we got more skeleton, uh, it turns out to not be. Uh, I don't know as though, I mean, it's still pretty intimidating. It's very large and the hands are still scary, but uh, it's not this massive, uh, massive carnivorous animal that would try to eat you. Uh, it has a very large body, but we're really starting now to see this movement towards hollow uh, pneumatized bones. A lot of the bones have grooves to accommodate air sacs and open space in there. Uh, remember that when we say hollow bones, it's not like an open cylinder. There's kind of this network of interlaced uh, bony members that give it support and structure but there's air in between. So uh, if you ever played that game, uh, Pickup Sticks, I guess it is, there's like kind of like all twisted together with lots of room in between. Uh, another thing that we see is that we at the very end of its tail, uh, the tail is still pretty long. So like if we think about modern birds, uh, most of the tail that we see is actually feathers. Uh, the very end of the bird's spine is pretty abrupt and it ends with a, a pigeo style, this kind of abrupt little kind of like ball at the end of the spine. Uh, this dinosaur has that uh, at the end of its long tail. And it also has filamentous feathers that come off of that. Uh, so this is not the bird-like form that we'll see later uh, because it still has the long tail. That's something that takes a while to go away. Uh, but we're starting to see an evolution towards that where the tail is somewhat reduced and it's tipped by this pigeon style. Uh, we also still see the three fingers with these massive claws. And again, if you look at the dentition, the teeth, and you look at the, the, the jaw, uh, it's probably omnivorous, probably eating fish, uh, probably eating some plant material as well. And so again, we're seeing this trend away from macro carnivory, we're not eating other dinosaurs anymore. We're eating fish, eating plants, and eventually sort of move away from even eating the fish meat and sort of start eating like more insectivorous, eating insects, eating exclusively plant material, 
uh, becoming kind of more bird-like, although even some modern birds, the raptors, are still carnivorous, um, and a lot of insectivorous birds. Uh, Ornithomimus, uh, the bird mimic, is uh, found in the late Cretaceous of North America, and it was named by our good friend Marsh uh, during the Bone Wars. Uh, it has a very bird-like foot, that's where the name comes from, and again we see these elongate uh, metatarsals, the ankle bones, uh, probably a very swift uh, ostrich-like runner. How do we tell? Well, look at the skeleton. Uh, if I showed you this skeleton, uh, you might even say, oh, well, that's an ostrich. Uh, the arms kind of give it away, <laughs> but other than that, it looks very much like an ostrich, and it's uh, some reconstructions place its speed at about the same as an ostrich, which is about like 40-ish miles an hour, about twice as fast as the fastest human. So uh, not like cheetah-like speeds, but pretty fast. Uh, and it's a toothless omnivore. So the teeth are, are fully gone here, uh, developing more kind of towards like a beak-like state, uh, probably eating insects, uh, some plant material probably. Uh, and we, we again see this trend away from macro carnivoria. Uh, there are also traces of pennate feathers found on the lower arm, so pennate like elongate feathers, like almost like flight feathers. Uh, but younger adults probably have like uh, more plumose feathers, and so they tend to maybe develop those more pennate feathers later on in life throughout the development. Um, and again, you see very much looks like an ostrich, very much runs like an ostrich. You see the relative size here compared to a human, it's, you know, a pretty big pretty much ostrich sized. I think ostriches are probably just a little bit smaller than this. Uh, ostriches kind of look you eye to eye, I think, but um, looks a lot like an ostrich. What can I say? That's why they call it that. Uh, so that's all we're going to talk about for today. We've gone over this whole half of the Solarisauria. Uh, next time we're going to talk about this branch here, uh, the, the Mana Raptora. So the, the grasping hands or the seizing hands. And we're going to go all the way up through to the very earliest birds. And we're gonna stop there. We're not gonna actually cover birds. We'll talk about birds a little bit at the end of the semester when we get to the other side of the mass extinction that ends all of the non-avian dinosaurs, whereas the birds persist. Uh, hopefully you're starting to see the pattern of potentially why uh, when the meteor hits and stuff starts going south and conditions get very bad, would you rather be a giant Tyrannosaurus apex predator carnivore, or would you want to be something that's a little bit smaller, needs less food, and is able to subsist on insects, and is a very omnivorous, versatile diet? Uh, hmm, well, let's find out. So that's all we got for today. Uh, hope you're enjoying that. Thank you for playing along, and goodbye. <laughs>